begin. So hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. My name is Josh Clark. I'm the head of the Landmark School, and you are joining one of our Ed Chats, which is an opportunity for me to kind of really live out an intellectual fantasy where I get to uh, meet and, and talk with folks who I think have just a fascinating expertise and perspective on all things education, dyslexia, and the world, and also how this might collide and come together um, uh, with the future of education and the impacts of AI and artificial intelligence. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, you are at a very special Ed Chat for multiple reasons, uh, not only because of the prestige and expertise of uh, my guest today, but also this is the first time we've done it live together, right? So usually we've been doing this over Zoom, um, but we are uh, in my office uh, uh, making this work together. So uh, wonderful. Overriding the rules. Exactly, exactly. Already we're overriding, that's right. So I'm so excited to introduce uh, my friend and guest, Dr. Elena Greg. Thank you, Greg. I'm sorry, my own dyslexia. Anytime I have a name, I absolutely panic. So thank you. Um, uh, so excited uh, to have Elena with us, uh, and among many other accomplishments that I will let uh, her speak to in just a moment. Uh, we came to know each other through the uh, International Dyslexia Association. Uh, where Elena serves as uh, uh, formerly on the board and now uh, well, serves on the board as chair of the scientific advisory uh, uh, board um, that helps influence and make sure that IDA is responding and following the most latest research and science. Um, she, throughout her career, has had many uh, impressive appointments that, again, I will let her speak to in a moment, and is currently uh, a, a, professor, a professor at University of Houston, is that right? In Houston, Texas, um, but is in town in Boston right now um, uh, on her way to New Haven, uh, uh, and I'll let her again speak to all those things, because formerly, formerly at Yale, is that yeah. right? Yeah, for 25 years at Yale. That's what I thought, yeah, so, so excited uh, to have this uh, conversation. Before we begin, I would love, would you mind... Um, introducing yourself a little bit more and talking a little bit more about kind of your field of research and um, uh, kind of how you look and uh, think about the world of dyslexia, reading disabilities, and so on and so forth. Uh, that question was not. I know, it's so bad. I know, I know, I've already cheated. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, no, but uh, globally, I am um, a child developmentalist, and um, I have um, probed um, the kind of trajectory of child development uh, from different disciplinary viewpoints. I have degrees in psychology, developmental clinical psychology. Uh, I also have a degree in genetics and I'm a practicing clinical psychologist who is interested in children. And we have, uh, we started this clinic at Yale and then moved it to Houston. So I'm saying uh, that is now uh, abbreviated as Hey Ask. Uh, for uh, uh, academic skills clinics. So we're interested in working with kids anywhere from three to 18, uh, trying to understand their individual developmental profiles and then helping them with accommodations, accelerations, uh, pluses, minuses, whatever, um, working with our school districts as well. Uh, yeah, and trying to maximize on their uh, strengths and, um, you know, minimize or compensate for their weaknesses. Beautiful. So that's you look off script already. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I'm much better than I could have ever done. Thank you. Um, so uh, going back to the uh, uh, questions that I did share with you a little ahead of time, you know, one of the things I've always wanted to do if I had an opportunity like this is to begin these conversations by just talking about school, right? And your relationship with school. I mean, you're somebody, as you just explained, studies child development, fascinated with this kind of progress. And certainly in, in kind of Western tradition in the States, school is a defining part of that. So I would be fascinated just to kind of hear what was school like for you, what, what, you know? Well, I mean, I actually did think about this question and I uh, think I'm about to disappoint you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, um, uh, my schooling was just a regular component of my life. I mean, I didn't uh, treat it as either great or awful. I didn't feel that it was any different from what I needed to do every day, meaning, you know, uh, consume some food do camping with my parents because uh, that was a part of my, uh, you know, upbringing or, um, you know, go to music classes or I was a swimmer when I was a child. So I did all of that and school was a part of that. You sure. know, school was something that I spent X number of hours every day. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't particularly uh, a large or, you know, many hours. I think our primary school was probably limited to about 
maybe four, like eight to 12, something like that. And then with years it grow maybe to six. Uh, so, uh, but, uh, you know, overall, not particularly memorable experience. I liked some teachers more than others. Uh, just like I liked some other adults in my life uh, through different activities uh, more than others. I like some subjects more than others, you know, but a uh, huge summer vacation, three months, uh, was also very important for development and exposure to different types of life. Uh, and uh, school was just one of those exposures. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing particularly memorable. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's uh, in, in ways memorable unto itself. Cause that's kind of the, some of the interesting things I'm learning is, you know, for some people, school is this kind of a uh, experience that almost can't get past. Right. You, you know, I was interviewing somebody recently and he was speaking of a colleague who in working with independent schools as uh, school leaders, as an incredibly accomplished author, researcher, kind of still like just shuts down. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and he, he's a professor at Harvard, but you know, it's kind of like in the principal's office all over again. So I just think that's that's fascinating. And you grew up in Russia, is that right? Is no, I grew up in the Soviet Union. Soviet, okay, gotcha. And so different countries. Different that's yes, yeah, that very yeah, thank you for that. Uh and was kind of how we think of kind of the Western school system, is that similar to what you experienced in terms of just this? We didn't really have any alternative uh to the public education. It was all public education, it was all free. Uh it was all uh extremely um harmonized, uh, you know, unified. So we're all, I mean, one of the uh, remarkable things of the old, uh, old, old kind of Soviet style of education that the whole country, which has 12 time zones was wow. on the same page, you know, yeah. <laughs> had, now it's a different country again, had 12 zones, was on the same page of a given textbook. So unified textbooks, unified programs, wow. unified everything, unified exams. So on January 5th of, you know, whatever year, all third graders were on the same page. In the same wow. Time. So, yeah, so different. Yeah, very different. Yeah. Um, so I say very different. And, you know, at, at times, I, I wonder if U.S. schools actually do something similar, uh, even if it's not by design. Um, but a whole other whole other topic. Yes. Um, uh, I will be cool. So, um, Obviously, you know, one of the things that I'm fascinated and want to pick your brain about is artificial intelligence, what this might mean, what this might look at. Um, and for the purposes of our conversation, how do you define AI? So, you know, there's 10,000 ways, it's all over the news. Just for the purposes of our conversation, how, how would you talk about it or want, want us to think about it? Yeah, with your permission, I'm going to borrow a definition uh, uh, from um, um, well, this particular um, um, case, um, Norbert Weiners was, uh, you know, the, the, the father of this field in many ways, and, uh, uh, um, you know, something, the field that he came up with is called cybernetics, right? So, so he defined it, uh, you know, metaphorically, right? So, uh, so this is the reality in which machines learn and develop our foreseen strategies at rates that buffle their programmers. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. I so that. I think I think there are two uh, very important facets of this definition. The first facet is about machines. It's not about humans, right. right? So that's the artificial part. So everything that is related to machines is algorithm based, right? So that's how they learn. They don't. I mean, it's not osmosis. Right. It's not imitation it's statistical learning, right? It's exposure to associations and derivation of subsequent uh, connections based on particular algorithmic approaches, right? So, and, um, you know, by definition is not human, but the other very important part of this reference is the word intelligence, which again, that's something that the word that humans came up with, right? So, and that means that it's over and above what's given. Mm -hmm. So you derive something that doesn't exist from associations that are either presented to you or observed by you or imitated by you or whatever. So for machines, it's all algorithm based. So there is nothing, I mean, we tend to give it a lot of intentionality and was it, especially within the last year or so. But in fact, there is no will 
Right, right, yes, yes. So we what aim for more prizes, of course. Prizes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Save yes, yes. Uh, right, which which is this interesting kind of uh, uh, it, that often gets lost to your point. We, we forget that it really is just a series of algorithms, right? Well, it's very, I mean, you know, uh, it's very human to prescribe intentionality. Yes. We can do it with stones, right? And obelisks and sculptures, right? Yeah. We can do it with trees. We can do it with our cars. We certainly, I mean, I certainly believe that all of my laptops have you know, different characters, right? right? Yeah, so exactly. they, right, they yeah. respond to me or not, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, but that's very human to right. interpret something which is not human as something that might have intentions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which, again, so I'm going a little off script, but just thinking about your background, because I have read a lot about that and I have read um, some of the hype around artificial intelligence and even from its own creators, forgetting that they are prescribing to it this idea that it does have some kind of intention or it does have some kind of um, godlike qualities, you know, and so much of the kind of concern about it taking over the world might be a little overhyped just based on its own creators wanting to assign it these human-like characteristics. And again, a little off script, but just given your expertise, that, is that like a unique part of development? Is that something that we do as human beings as we, we kind of have this evolutionary need to see ourselves in everything? Uh, I, I think that's a part of, I mean, that's an interesting point you just made. Uh, you just made. It's a part of this evolutionary uh, development of something that we still think is human exclusively, which is consciousness, mm -hmm. right? So, and uh, consciousness is something that is derived, meta by definition, right? So you can't, you, you can't, replicate uh all of our organs but you cannot replicate consciousness mm -hmm. right so now we've replicated language right yeah. so because we understood how general rules of language acquisition work and we reintroduced those rules right in those large language models uh that are you know, a version of AI, mm -hmm. ultimately among many that we have tried, uh, whether it's going to be the best or the only, it's to be determined. I mean, it's not even concurrently, we have AI for images, we have uh, AI for speech. Uh, you know, ChatGPT uses text, but uh, G4, version mm -hmm. four, now includes images, yeah. but it's proprietary. So we don't really know what it's doing. It's not an open um, access right. solution, right? right? But there are competitors uh, uh, and those competitors uh, introduce open access versions, um, different versions of AI. And um, um, I, I just have to acknowledge that uh, a lot of what I've learned, I, I, I learned from my junior colleagues in my lab. And uh, just on the way here, I had a conversation with um, uh, Conrad Chik, who just defended his dissertation last Monday. So he is a PhD and what, uh, four days ago? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Right. something like that. Congratulations. So yeah, and another postdoc in the lab, Pavel Dabrenian, and the corner are really AI gurus, uh, and they, uh, follow the the developments uh, of uh, the systems very closely, and in particular, um, Connor was someone you might know, Yusra Ahmed. Um, she is a dyslexia researcher, so they're working on um, an image version of AI where they're looking at hundreds and hundreds of samples of handwritten materials, trying to define based on of uh, multiple features they're co-analyzing um, writing disabilities. Oh, wow. So yeah. the idea being that we might be able to one day feed in a writing sample and instantly understand what dysgraphia or- Right, and wow. what particular mistakes are common for that particular individual and where you want to start your intervention uh, uh, kind of, um, you know, introduction point, if you wish, because 
just like with uh, language models, a lot of that is exposure and training. Yeah, right? yeah. So you have to have multiple exposure and multiple repetitions. Boring. Yeah. And uh, very, you know, non-human when you talk about our intentions. Right. But that's, in fact, how we learn. Most of our learning is by repetition. Well, and so, so much about that, that fascinates me because, you know, as, as a school leader and somebody that, you know, works in this space, we're all diagnostic and prescriptive, right? That's the idea. But really, we're kind of still, at the end of the day, identifying you have a problem and we're going to throw a lot of things at you until we're able to kind of figure out a little bit better where you, your individual remediation might lie or what you might need. So what you're describing already is kind of this like fantasy of mine that we would one day be able to use something like an AI to just better understand what's almost the biggest bang for our buck, right? You know, what, where, where are you struggling and where might we intervene so much quicker? Is that, is that fair? Is that? But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure that we all agree and tell me if you disagree, but I just <laughs> assume that it's the case that the best education is about individualization, right? right? So, and the question is, how can you get quicker? Yes. So that individual, whatever, you know, pathway, trajectory, or a combination of common and specialized, you know, uh, programs that will allow the best outcome for a kid, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's, and, um, it's costly, or yeah. it used to be costly because you can't have a teacher per child. Otherwise, you know, it will be right. unsupported, right? This whole idea of uh, general public education was about taking up as many kids as possible to one teacher so yeah. you can distribute the wealth, right? The educational wealth. Uh, but, you know, in fact, uh, uh, I don't know if you're a, a, a you know a Star Trek uh, a fan or not, but remember in in one of the movies there was this uh, 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 this notion of future school with Doctor Spock, uh, and uh, in you know he was uh, simple as an example of quote unquote future education, right? And all we saw was really like individualized holes or classrooms where AI interacts with the mm -hmm. child and provides that repetitive environment, right? So whether you could capitalize on strengths, so give him or her more and more and more of what he likes and yet remediate for weaknesses, give him or her more and more of what he doesn't like but needs to come. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and then, and then the most, the funniest thing about that particular, and I have a clip, I, I uh, sometimes use it in my lecture, so I can send it to you if your audience is interested, so you understand sure. what I, yeah, so what I mean. But the funniest thing about this whole image, which I completely reject, is what is the role of the teacher, though? Mm -hmm. Right, right. right? It, and yeah. in that particular reiteration of the future reality, teachers are just wandering in between this classrooms as if they're a police officer. It's just making sure that everything is in order. Right. And I reject it. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think that, you know, if we cancel teacher, if, you, if we uh, cancel teachers and mentors and inspires and just rely on AI, uh, there's going to be no human education. Right. Yeah. I, I completely and agree. machine learning. Right. Right. I completely agree. But what? But that same example. I mean, even going back to this idea of being able to take writing samples one day and just immediately have a kind of a, a diagnosis, or and we can even talk about his diagnosis, even the word, but an indication of what a child needs. A lot. I feel like it would liberate teachers to actually make human connections because we ask teachers to do so much, and as you know, through our work with IDA, there's so much by no fault of their own that teachers don't know. And so then we're trying to re-educate it. And there are so many competing interests in a classroom that have nothing to do with kids, to be perfectly honest. And if we were able to remove some of those with AI so that it could be about relationships and it could be about motivation and understanding and all those things, I think that's, to your point, I think the most powerful part about what a teacher could do. Um, well, I mean, I like the idea of liberating teachers and preserving their intentionality, right? So they can intentionally, you know, express themselves as teachers, yeah. right? Inspires, uh, knowledge translators, whatever. I don't know how you guys define it yourselves, but hopefully somewhere there rather than being on page five of this right. particular textbook and just reading it out loud. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd stick in on this for just a moment. Do you also foresee, is there a world where 
uh, again, there's um, kind of that Star Trek example, AI is coming and it can just kind of feed you what you need. Do you also think, along with this work that might be happening around writing samples, do you foresee that we might be able to accelerate the diagnostic process? And again, we can talk whether or not we actually think diagnosis is the word, but is there a world maybe where we're kind of spelling errors or the way in which you, you know, or, or the way in which you even attempt to decode a word? Do you think there's a world where we don't, like right now in so many systems, it's a year long process, you know, it's that's the double before we kind of get to a point where we acknowledge that a child might need an individual uh, uh, support plan. Do you think AI could accelerate that in that same way? Well, I mean, I really, uh, uh, yeah, and I, uh, and thank you very much for sharing your previous uh, podcast. I really like this idea of um, reckoning, right? Yeah. Which uh, uh, Dr. Dennis' uh, conversation generated. I mean, uh, you know, we use, we have used machines for centuries, right? Yeah. We have used machines to uh, free our mind to do something else, right? We don't need to spend days or hours thinking how to lift a rock, right? Right. right. Or cultivate, you know, a piece of uh, soil, right? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, right? So, that, so I, from my point of view, AI is just that. It's a machine. And we need to learn how to use it, but everything can be distracted, yeah. right? So, um, you know, all heavy machinery can generate problems, right? Yeah. So and we've, we've uh, challenged ourselves and whether successful or not, I think it's a separate conversation, but we repeatedly challenge ourselves with invasion, uh, with inventions that, Actually, yeah, that was a sleep, but an interesting sleep that might turn into invention in, invasions on yeah, human yeah, yeah, experience, yeah, right? Yeah. And human race, yeah. right? Uh, whether it's genetically modified organisms, right? Or uh, any kind of technology. Remember, I mean, you might not remember, <laughs> but I do the conversations in the 70s about how harmful TV is uh, for mm-hmm. yeah. child development, right? So, and you get a uh, nuclear power. Right, yeah, uh, look like catastrophes, right? So, all of that every time there is a huge uh shift in our um relationships with the world, uh, with the world of machines. We question, okay, are they going to destroy us now or later? Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. You know, well, and then we go over a particular hump, and there is a new invention, and we're like, okay, well, are they going to de- destroy us now or later? Because yeah. remember, Edison's electricity and the phone and everything that is a major accelerator yeah. right, of our relationships with the environment around us generates this question. Are we done? Or uh, do we have, you know, maybe half a century, maybe centuries or as a, as a, as a distinct kind of part of whatever, the galaxy or whatever, yeah. right? or are we done and every single will fall back to nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, I expect the TV one's such a great one because you, you're right, there was this whole, you know, Postman or what, there was all this conversation about, you know, generation raised on TV and what, what that's going to do to us. Uh, and I'm sure it did things, but clearly we're still, to your point, we're still existing. So um, and with that too, yesterday I interviewed um, a gentleman named Michael Warren, who's kind of this educational futurist. It was fascinating. But he talked about this idea of threat rigidity and that when we are, when something is introduced um, and introduced as a threat, it can mobilize resources, but there's also some of the human instinct to then become very rigid in our response to preserve what exists. Out of curiosity, in your role as a scientist, because you're you're really my first opportunity to talk to a scientist who's not a scientist of AI machines, you know, is, a, do you think your field will, will it be transformed by the capacity of AI, not by AI itself in terms of, you know, uh, its uses uh, for folks in education, but do you, do you foresee being able to come to solutions quicker or that the, your kind of scientific process might change slightly or be accelerated through these tools? It has changed already. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't think that anybody in the lab, like, he uses R or Python or any of the programming languages, uh, you know, writes basic code anymore. I could yeah. you know, all you need to do is to ask whatever your 
preferred version uh, is, right? Whether it's ChatGPT or Bing or whatever, right? So I need to do this and that. What is the code for this? Yeah. Right. So they, I don't think that anybody in the lab writes routine code anymore because why? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you could preserve your mental energy or physical energy. You can interact with friends. You can go for a run rather yeah. than spend hours coding. So you don't really don't need to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so but this is a very, it's like lifting rocks, right? right? So you don't really need to have, you know, 400, you know, Egyptians building a, a pyramid, you know, to weave this humanity thing, right? A machine can do it for you in seconds and only with one person, yeah. technically speaking. Yeah. Right? So the same thing here. I mean, you're just outsourcing. You're just outsourcing right. most of the routine tasks, preserving uh, yourself for, but this is where this intentionality question um, comes back uh, because you are preserving yourself. The question is for what, mm. right? And uh, this, is, this is something that humans kind of, have changed their mind about, right? Because uh, uh, they, they're they preserving themselves for what? Yeah. Future benefit, personal uh, investments, more money, more power, more right. land. I mean, you know, this is where the value judgment is going to come. Um, you know, but human errors, whether they're AI-based or nuclear power-based or, you know, um, politically-based, they happen. Yeah. Right. So, and whether AI can be the battlefield for yet another human error, you know, the programmer who would be surprised he didn't mean to, yeah. but it happened, whether it's going to be a financial banking or industrial error or some other error. Yeah, no, totally possible. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But no intentionality. It will still be human error. Uh, interpreted by an eye, right. just like it can be interpreted again, uh, you know, by heavy machinery or whatever. Interpreted not intentionally. Right. Instructions received, wrong instructions. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting you said. I was listening um, yesterday to a podcast, uh, the Ezra Klein show, and he was introduced in interviewing the gentleman who is in charge of DeepMind and again Google, which is um, they did the protein folding, which I don't fully understand other than to understand it's a big deal. <laughs> Uh, but he was explaining kind of to that point around the intentionality and kind of human error that they're getting to the point where uh, developing an AI that can develop itself, if you will, versus the limitations of how a human would understand it and think about it. Because we somewhat not even bring in our biases in terms of how we think the world works around people and race and all those things, but also just on how we, what we think is possible. And so machines that might be able to that aren't limited by our own perceived limitations of how the world works and operates anyway i, I found it yeah absolutely. i just want to go back to Weiner's quote right so develop unforeseen strategies at rates that buffer their programmers yes but if you're looking um uh, if you if you're considering something like nuclear chain reactions Right for molecular processes that would trigger unknowingly, yeah, that result in mutations, right, right. or some other alterations to uh, some, you know, biological processes, uh, protein folding, yeah, you know, whatever. You know, it's all for me. I'm not particularly worried about AI uh, more than anything else that humans mm -hmm. create. Because it's a yeah. creation with unforeseen uh, potential, yeah. and unforeseen yeah. consequences. Yes, yeah. whether uh, it's going to be just like nuclear power or anything like that, whether it could result in our destruction. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, right? It's not just AI that it's can destroy not, us. It's, it's not yeah. unique. Yeah, that's a very important. Um, all right, so I continuing on this, I'm going to go a little off script, so forgive me, but I. Um, uh, I was flying home just recently and my flight got canceled. So I had all this time to myself uh, and I uh, started um, reading and reviewing some of the many, many publications you've put out, um, like hundreds at this point, right? I mean, peer review. Yeah, well, somewhere. Yeah, so, yeah, so, but I, I full transparency, I was using AI um, because 
you know, it was fascinating to me through a plugin with ChatGPT4, I could send it a link to a, a copy of, of uh, one of your publications and, you know, it would summarize it for me and uh, all those things. And one thing that came across, I think just recently in uh, the Journal of Intelligence, um, you and some colleagues, and if you don't mind, please name them for me in a moment, but wrote a article um, uh, highlighting or suggesting that language itself is an evolutionary product versus a, maybe a bi biologically innate ability. And I'm taking a soft script, but I found it so fascinating. And as a result, it evolves and can change. And part of what can uh, uh, necessitate its evolution and change is technology itself. Is, am I, is that fair? So I found this so fascinating. So my first question is, in reading it, and uh, it made complete sense to me, but is that a controversial idea that language is evolutionary versus some kind of biologically innate? Is that are you, are you is that a novel idea that you all are presenting that others would disagree with? Or well, I mean, can I take us um, a few steps back? Please. Right. So um, the paper that you're referring, uh, uh, I think, is a paper, uh, again, in, in the Journal of Intelligence by Ilya Markov and Ksenia Kreditorino and myself. Both Ilya and Ksenia are linguists by training. They're not psychologists or geneticists or whatever. That's that's what I love about my lab. Uh, by the way, uh, Connor, whom I mentioned, is a physicist by training. So how do they, <laughs> how do they know all yeah. of that? Yeah. I mean, somehow they all collapse um, in um, our environment, which is wonderful. So, you know, we we don't tend to write uh, papers that are either controversial or not by definition. We try to go through our process with our dissertations, um, you know, our granting activities and so forth, or requests like this one, right? And then start talking about things. And if we feel that we have something to say, you know, yeah. then we uh, produce something, whether it's going to be well received or noticed. I mean, you never know, right? right? So, um, or ignored completely. Um, you know, you, you never know. Uh, but in this particular piece, I think the statement that we were trying to make has to do with, uh, you know, our thinking about different types of language as human music, right? So technically, you know, we're excluding in this particular narration, we are excluding everything that uh, precedes uh, human language, mm -hmm. right? But if you try to, um, you know, put together a couple of observations, you know, we, we think that there are puzzles that we're trying to resolve um, uh, in, in, in part in these discussions, which is, okay, so for spoken language to uh, appear evolutionary, um, you know, to cause a million stuff, presumably, right? Because current evidence suggests that spoken language appeared somewhere prior to the differenti differentiation of um, you know, modern human and uh, the Neanderthal, where the Denisovans had it or not, where the Neanderthal had it or not, these are the life questions. They haven't been answered because, of course, spoken language doesn't have any prints right. yeah, to yeah. relate to, it, right? So, but somewhere between 150 and 200,000 uh, years ago, that occurred, right? So, but then, um, you know, if you look at the manifestation of print, right, again, somewhere around uh, 5,000 to 350, uh, you know, BC. So the magnitude, the scale mm -hmm. is very different, right? So from hundreds of thousands or perhaps a million, you know, when I will condense to only, I mean, 20 to 25,000, like yeah. a totally different scale. But now look about, and that particular piece was mostly about the manifestation of digital language, mm -hmm. which is like, how are you? When we type, how are you? We don't type, how are you anymore? Right. We just type, you know, or for you. It's for, and then 
you know, you, not even a Y, yeah. right? Just, so this kind of abbreviations and that kind of interaction goes in print, uh, uh, but only on digital devices is in you, right? Uh, just like, you know, all kinds of um, signaling with faces or images, you know, we're going back to a pre-written, pre-print, yeah. right? So when we all of a sudden use different symbols to communicate emotions rather than in words or in, I mean, how often do you call it? Right, yeah, yeah. It's just text. Right, right, yes. So this is a new type of interaction. Yeah. This is a new type of language, right? And look at its scale. We're talking about since 1970s. Yeah. Right, so maybe thirty years, maybe fifty years at most. Yeah. Rather than you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, I mean the scale. Yeah. Has transformed, right? It's compressed yeah. very much. So, but if you and I are using it, right, and we understand that it's a changing reality, then you know is that. What do we need to do about this as an educational authority? Do we need to prohibit? Do we need to engage? Do we need to redesign our lessons? How do we respond, right? Yeah. So print occurred, let's say, 50,000 years ago. It's probably an overestimate, but okay. Uh, but, um, you know, we started teaching it as a common skill that we anticipate our youngsters to master so they can participate in modern society only what, 100 years ago? Yeah. So, and that was hanging around as an elite skill that, uh, you know, schools did not, I mean, we, uh, we certainly had religious education for much longer, mostly spoken and memory-based education before deciding to teach everybody how to read. Yeah. As a civilization. Yeah. So, I mean, this, this interesting um, variations of the same in terms of language evolution, and that was uh, written for a particular um, uh, special issue that a colleague, David Price from Chile, um, he's a professor at Catholic University of Chile, had decided to edit for the Journal of Intelligence, which is on Anthropocene which is this newly pronounced um, epoch, right? Geological epoch, because it was triggered by Dutch earth scientists who said, look, we can't really, we now uh, leave, um, you know, uh, marks of our interactions with nature on the geological history of this planet. Yeah. And other history of that planet, right? So we're not just responding to something from the space, whether it's radiation or meteorites or whatever, right? We're actually changing the planet because of our activity. So, you know, different authorities decided that we are now in the epoch of the man, which is interesting. And AI, digital language, you know, many, many other things are direct products of yeah. our interaction with the planet and with the galaxy around us. And we ourselves generate our tools. But now we're not responding to the planet and to the nature. We're changing. Right. Everything you just said blew my mind. Uh, that was fascinating. I, you're right. So this this idea of right, we are no longer responsive. We are actually changing. And to, your, and to me, it goes right back to the point of intention. I'm not even convinced we're intentionally changing or even aware of change if we're just doing it. Um, and I think also to your point, when you began about just the, the, the speed of change or the speed of adoption, right? In, you know, from, from kind of spoken language to print to now this idea of, of digital language. And I love that. I never thought about how, for how long as a society, however you want to phrase that, we value the religious education as the, as the purpose of education and how relatively recently, in the grand scheme of things, reading print has become such an important piece. And do you, so a couple of questions on that. One is, do you foresee, or and maybe it's probably an unfair question, but 
how could AI, the idea that language is now so, um, I, I, I talk about, uh, you know, Mark Seidenberg's book, The Language at the Speed of Sight. Now it's the speed of Wi-Fi, right? So what does that mean? What does that look like? What might that mean? And as someone who is uh, so interested in child development, are these good things, bad things, or is that even the question to be asking? If, if oh, no, it, it is a question to be asking, right? So, <laughs> you know, and this tension between is technology good or bad for a child, you know, and how it needs to be dosaged and, um, yeah. You know, it's very omnipresent, I think, in the literature. And I'm sure, I'm not sure what you're doing with smartphones and iPads and your school. Yeah. Do you, like, prohibit them or, uh, yeah. you, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a never-ending yeah. battle of, yes. Right. But but see, I think that the never-ending battle needs to get wider than perhaps it is now. Uh, because... Um, uh, just the other day I was driving and I typically listen to NPR, like probably most of us do, and I happened to hear this particular episode. I think it was um, actually cited it for myself, so let me just make sure that I pronounce everything correctly here and give the right date. Yeah, so July 15th and a NPR contributor who calls herself a screen time consultant, Emily Churkin, right, mm -hmm. suggested that we should delay all of it, meaning as usage of smartphone, digitalization, and all of that, as long as we can. But do you agree with that? That we should delay introducing it? Right. As like long if, as we can. Teens are asking for smartphones, right? Do you give it to them or not? Yeah. Well, I, see, that's, that's, there is, there are, I mean, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> no. so I'm just saying that there are layers to those questions. And I'm not even going to engage in any open debates here. Sure. Because that's not the point of this conversation, right? But I just, um, I mean, you know, like if you look at things historically, when any prohibitions ever worked, mm. especially Especially if we know that we're not going to cancel them. Right. Are we going to cancel them as civilization? Never. Well, they're they're yeah. they're part of us. Yeah. Right, now, right. So, what are we actually philosophically and culturally and culturologically and ethically doing with prohibition of anything? Right. Right. So that's the first question I would like to be seen to be discussed. Secondly, going back to that. Um, an illusion of the impact on technology cannot believe it or not you, you think that it's such an important question right but there are no data hmm. well in part because uh, technology develops much quicker than a human child right so we don't really have clear well-designed longitudinal studies that conclusively tell us that tv is bad because, you know, we left the TV question in the 70s yeah. and moved on yeah. <laughs> and never evaluated the outcome of, I don't know, five uh, hours of TV fortune versus 30, you know, type of the program. Why did you do? We don't know. I mean, because the, the question is asked. Yeah. Right. right. So yeah. We, we, we would not know, <laughs> you know. There is going to be no evidence based evidence based answer to the question of the impact of smartphone because I mean I'm going to put you on the spot here. Yeah, yeah, Give me a number of years when something else right. will come around. I remember distinctly when satellite phone come around, right? So yeah, they yeah, were this yeah. big. And very few of us had access and were mesmerized by, you know, some important person who had that humongous saying, carrying yeah. that around, you know, and being able through a number of satellites to call, you know, someone else elsewhere, right? So it was, I mean, I remember days when in order to call my parents as a graduate student at Yale, I needed to go to the phone station. Right, yeah. And, you know, make a reservation for a 5 p.m. phone call to Russia, right? Yeah. So, you know, it seems like yeah, that's 
totally obsolete. Yeah. As as a, as as a piece of reality it doesn't doesn't exist anymore. So I I don't know anything about the impact on technology from a rigorous evidence based point of view. I don't think that there are relevant data. Yeah. That so that is, I've never really thought about that. Has actually answered anecdotal questions I've always had. Well, why don't we know? But it makes complete sense because it. You know, giving a child an iPad, for instance, and tracking their life is not something we can do because the iPad will be, by the time they're three or whatever it is, it'll be a new technology. Well, I mean, how many variables? Yeah. I mean, you know, even in, in a life, I mean, you know, I'm always, it was my iPhone, I'm always like three or four versions behind because I'm like, I could have used the first one were not for my students who would say, well, you really, I mean, you really have to catch up, you know, Dr. Gagarin, yeah, you yeah, really yeah. cannot use that piece of technology anymore. You know, just like with everything else, I'm trying to catch up to my junior colleagues who are really ahead of me because I don't pay attention to this, but they tell me and I go and change my plan, you know, and certainly enjoy something else, Yeah, right? That my previous version could not do. Right, yeah. So, but I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think that being prescriptive, unwise, and unthoughtful is the worst we can do. Mm -hmm. So we definitely have to have the discussions. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to, you know, yeah, we can't have a longitudinal study, but at least, you know, if we if we are trying to make recommendations, right? So let's be consensus based let's open discussion let's figure out what we actually know don't know yeah. not by hearsay right right well and again to me to this whole conversation one of my biggest takeaways is your term intention intentionality because that's often what happens too is we give kids phones but what what is what is the outcomes that we want and then how do we drive kids towards those outcomes um because i think there could be a lot of great things that can come of it uh and boundaries too, right, right? right? So we set up boundaries about everything, moral and immoral behavior, you know, number of hours for sleep, diets. I mean, why can't we set up, uh, you know, a set of boundaries that are not exclusionary and prohibitionary, right? but thoughtful, controllable, and modifiable, and rewardable. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's such an important conversation because to your point, you know, we had the satellite phones and then we, you know, we've evolved to, to iPhones and all these things. And what's, what I find so fascinating about AI, and I think what part of the reason I want to have these conversations is, you know, I, at the time, the iPhone was the fastest adopted piece of technology ever, right? You know, uh, and I don't have all the exact statistics, but as I understand it, uh, as it hit the consumer market, it was the fastest adopted, though it took, you know, several years. The thing that has surpassed it is AI. AI, cut, you know, the chatbot GPT three and now four. That was adopted at a rate exponentially faster than even the iPhone. And what I think is fascinating to me is that you know, the iPhone, even early internet, were all aspirational. Right? I remember like getting dial-up internet and like we had to call the phone company. It was a whole thing. You convince your parents, and then you had to save up for the iPhone. AI is just there. It is just there. Um, and so what I, I'm, and again, this is not this, this is just a question I'm asking to myself, summed up rhetorically, what is that going to mean? What, what, you know, we're already struggling to catch up at an adoption rate that, uh, you know, is several years. What's an adoption rate that's going to be several months going to look like? And I, I don't know. It's just, well, we're changing. I mean, there is nothing wrong with stating that we're evolving culturally and uh, genetically. Yeah. I mean, our genetic uh, evolution has not changed, unlike those statements about the prohibition of our, our five bones. There is evidence that came from many longitudinal studies that we're changing genetically, too. So, um, yeah, it's a slow pace, right? By definition, things not because we don't have to have three legs right, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tomorrow or whatever. So it has to be paced. Uh, but we are all aware about cultural evolution, right? Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, certain things um, evolve quicker, like technology that our moral evolution, for yeah. example, you, you wish that that would, you know, go at comparable speed, but it's not. 
Right. Uh, right. So there are all these philosophical and ethical issues to consider. But I'm, again, I'm not particularly afraid of AI. I view it as yet another very interesting development. Um, I see certain repetitions of something that we've lived through before. I don't know if you remember the Human Genome Project mm -hmm. and the huge uh, controversial uh, fight, uh, you know, not fist fight, but it right. was a big issue whether that knowledge needs to stay in the public domain versus can be proprietor, yeah. right? So the public domain more, right? Yeah. So now ChatGPT, open and not, versus, uh, you know, Meta has mm -hmm. a version of AI, which is open, Llama, just on the way here, Connor and I were talking about possible studies, you know, our thinking was triggered by my preparation to this conversation and just basically thinking about all of that. And we're like, well, what do we need to do? So there's absolutely no way for us as scientists to reach out to open an eye and ask them for collaboration. Right. It doesn't exist. But we can, there is actually a form we can fill in as scientists and um, you know, discuss that uh through channels with Meta. Yeah. And utilize the llama, which is comparable to GPT-3, not four, but you know, for our research purposes. Yeah. They provide a license agreement, they provide stipulations for publications, which is fine with us. We cannot, as a you know, whether it's a science group or a university, we cannot replicate the CPU, just the CPU requirements mm, yeah. that are needed to train this model. There are humans. Yeah. You know, and the idea is that AI can be free uh, is also a little bit, um, you know, it needs, I mean, I'm not in a position to discuss that with any bit of knowledge, I'm just projecting my concern that I, 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 you have to have those capacities, right. extreme computational capacities, right? UK and its prime minister is openly discussing, you know, the possibility of using an AI in more and more applications in the UK, but the question is, do they have computational power? Yeah, right. Even there, right? right? If you think about other equal opportunities anywhere else in rural America, in Africa, right, in Bangladesh, right, right. So who who actually has those computational capacities that are needed to uh, not only utilize right connectivity issues and all that, but to keep updating, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you become obsolete as you like. What we started talking about um, GPT three in November. Something like that. Yeah. Right now it's four. Yeah. Right. So it's more at five. Right. I mean, so they have to more stand. Right. Right. Like who can compete? Right. And I think that's such a good point, right? Because I think most of us don't fully appreciate it's not only kind of the um it's not only what you right. can solicit by right. inputting, you have to be connected to it, right? right? You have to have the hardware, you have to have the capacity, you have to have accessibility, you have to have reliable Wi-Fi and all that. And like just brute force, right? Yeah. That none of us fully appreciate, like just yeah. Um, but to train it every time that you excel to the new generation, um, I read The Economist, and um, The Economist just had a special um, AI maybe three or four years ago, uh, three or four weeks ago. And, um, and, and yeah, I, I can send you the link if you're interested. But there is this graph, you know, AI is not, there's nothing new about it, right? We started talking, I think the first model was in the 50s. Yeah. But the computational power and the knowledge of algorithms, yeah. right, it was just not there. Yeah. So there were, according to economists, there were at least dozens. And you see a vertical line going this way in terms of the computational resources that I need. Yeah. And GPT-4 is at the very top. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, was, I was talking to somebody else as part of this series, and that was part of his point is that AI is amazing, but it's, it's the... 
it's the congruence of AI at a time with all the with super chips and with all these other things. Yeah, absolutely. That it's just uh, it's fascinating. Um, Intellectual power of a human, right? Who actually designs the training and making it feel human, like that alone, it, it has just skyrocketed our use of it. Because a lot of these things it might have been able to do, and I'm sure scientists have been doing machine learning and statistical now, you know, for a long time. But now that I can interact in it with it, and it makes and it feels like I'm talking to a person suddenly. It seems endless in its possibility. Right. Well, by typing or by speaking, how you interact by typing. Uh, yeah, usually by typing. Yeah. yeah. But see, that's that's another interesting um, question, which is like, what happens when you project um, a voice, mm -hmm. especially an accented voice like mm -hmm. mine? Yeah. Like I cannot stand any navigate. I can't even um, talk to Siri because she doesn't understand my accent. Yeah. So she can understand certain questions I'm asking, but I give up yeah. and switch to some other source of knowledge because she says, sorry, I can't understand you. Yeah. And that's the end of the conversation, right? Yeah. So whereas you, at least in our discussion, at least polite to tell me that you can cope with my accent, right? right? Or yeah. not to tell me that you can right. cope with my accent. I mean, she can't. Yeah. She just goes that. Yeah. Which your point too is going to then privilege people who have, you know, the dialect or whatever that that is preferred in this technology. Um, or, you know, typing again in proper English, right? So that's another conversation. Uh, like most of the corporate that uh, I see, and again, I don't know, uh, most of that is proprietary knowledge. Um, uh, and I just don't know much about Lama, this uh, mm -hmm. open, um, uh, uh, open source um, uh, meta product, right? So, but I just don't know. I mean, they're probably trained mostly on normative, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, corpora, right? So what happens if you train them on a set of products generated by kids with dyslexia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With asystematic errors. Yeah. Like something that doesn't follow the rules, but it's not like every dyslexic makes the same error. Right, the right. point is that you know the deficit is there, but it's uh, very often, um, you know, unreplicable. Right. right, right. So when there is no systematicity, uh, I mean, it's an open question. I don't think that people have done it. Right. right? So what if we? train on something rather than normative. Right. Yeah. I, yes. And I, I mean, I think it's a great point. And I, I, I hope there is a day where the computer power is available and that we can kind of customize our own, right? Like let's, so, cause even at a school like Landmark, just using our admission standards, we might look slightly different in the kind of um, the most common areas that we see than a school down the road that also works with a, a population, but has a different um, kind of boundary line for the kids, you know. So, yes, I, 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 it would be amazing if we if we could begin to feed that into it. And even more amazing if sex a kid were more consistent in the kind of mistakes they make. It would make our job so much easier. Right, but exactly. But it's your like point, my yeah. W's. I'm consistent in um, pronouncing my W's with an accent, but it's because I have an accent and certain regularity that is common to Spanish languages, right? If we don't have anything comparable phonetically to the sounds. But it's not the case of dyslexia. Right. Right. Um, all right. I'm changing our time. We're getting, uh, we, we are right oh, at an here. hour. Um, uh, so before uh, uh, before we end this, um, and first, this is fascinating. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, this is so great. <laughs> yeah, it was great to think about that. And again, to talk to my lab about that. So thank you. Oh, but that's how our papers come about. We're like, yeah. well, we, need, we don't know that. Let's figure out what yeah. we get right to well, oh, I'm so glad. And I'm so, it's been so helpful because, again, I've thus far, it's been a series of conversations with people who are kind of uh, in deep on AI in very obvious way. Like they study AI. They use AI. So it's been so fascinating to finally get a conversation about the intersection, right? Just to even hear you as a scientist, as someone who's doing research, thinking about how might we apply this? What might this mean? You know, all those things. Because, um, again, that to me is the most interesting thing moving forward is not AI itself, but how AI is in used, manipulated, uh, convert and converted in 
disciplines that you know can be all, hopefully augmented by it. Um, but with all that said, uh, uh, I think I share with you. I always like to end these with um, asking three things that we should either watch, or we should listen to, or that we should read that can have everything to do with this conversation, nothing to do with this conversation. Do do what would you leave us with? Well, I mean, you know, an idea that um, really kind of. I don't know whether it was directly stimulated in my mind by reading that book. Um, you know, and the book is oldish, right? So it's cool here. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's this collection by Henry Kissinger, Eric Schmidt, and Daniel Hetfield. I don't know if you've seen that on AI, right? It both published in the fall of last year. But I mean, you know, it's 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 a sophisticated interpretation of the changing reality, right? By people who are directly involved uh, with AI, either through Google or through MIT and so forth. But I'm seeing, you know, again, as a child developmental person, I was like, okay, well, this is interesting. You know, from a parent point of view, can you imagine a situation as we said, like, you know, 200,000 years ago when, you know, these children could speak much more than their parents could. And instead of hunting in silence or sleeping, they were sitting around the fire and conversing in whatever. You know, I'm sure that their parents were not pleased with them. Yeah, I didn't think about that kind of like changeover, yeah. But then, I mean, this of course is simplistic interpretation, sure. but then you could think about print, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think those parents would rather have their children work in the field or do something useful, you know, in their little shop or whatever, and they were hiding and reading to themselves in silence, you know, those yeah. first printed whatever yeah. manuscripts or whatever they were? I mean, I'm sure that the parents were not pleased with that because that goes back to the point that we, as the holder of the civilization just hold on to our values, right? Yeah. And I think AI is about, I mean, you are you're very progressive, but I'm not sure, you know, how all these people out there, all these parents, right, you know, feel about again interactions with technology, smartphone, AI, you know, the knowledge that they just don't read that much more. They yeah. need to read, they don't read that much more. Well, I mean, do does it actually matter? Because all that knowledge that we needed to look up encyclopedias, right? You know, for um, now, involve all our fingertips, yeah. seconds, you know, seconds, not even minutes away. You don't even need to go to the library, right? So that book kind of triggered me. And what's the title of that book? Is that uh, yeah, it's. I think it's it's very common. Uh, actually, if you search for the title, uh, the age of AI in our human future, right? Because if you look for the age of AI, it will come up with oh, yeah, 10,000. Yeah, yeah, different titles. Yeah. But it's by Henry Kissinger. Yeah. Right. So um, but then I was thinking about how important it is for us to remember that there are all these non-AI features like human passion and, and contradiction and conflict and all that for what we know AI is capable yeah. by definition and there is this uh, book that I just finished uh, reading by it's a translated book uh, by Khaled um, Khalifa a Syrian writer it's actually specifically captured in Aleppo um, and it's generations of uh, friendship between Muslims and Christian you mm -hmm. know families and there is another friend who is Jewish right so and that Kind of triangle of religion, human passion, conflict, friendship. I mean, just really fascinating representation of what I think an I is capable of. Yeah, yeah. It's the yeah. other side yeah. of the story. Yes. Yeah, so, and what's the title of that book? Uh, it's called No One Prayed Over Their Graves. Interesting. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Wow. All right. Is there a third? You, yeah, there is a third, but right. that gets even more con uh, conflictual, obviously, because, you know, here I am, you know, half Ukrainian, half Russian, right? Given what's going on. And I'm just trying to figure out whether there's any AI or any, you know, superpower that can stop all of that, right? Yeah. And, you know, I know that it's right and left on um, in mass media here, but I, if people are interested, there is this, um, uh, you know, it's in English, uh, a documentary that is called Broken Tides by Andrea Loshak, which actually offers a much more sophisticated insight into what's going on. To the conflict in Riga. Yeah. Wow, okay. 
totally no nags. No, but I love it. Yeah, yeah, no, but yeah. Wow. Well, this has been amazing. Well, thank you for having us. Oh. I mean, it's like I'm saying us because I'm representing a lab. The lab really, you know, helped me figure out what I'm missing, what I'm not understanding. You triggered with this invitation a whole bunch of conversations. So good. Fun. Well, good. Well, this was great. Uh, and thanks for everybody that uh, was able to join in. Uh, uh, and we will post everything uh, that you referenced uh, when yeah. we when we push yeah. it out. So we'll make sure everybody has links to all those things. Um, this was wonderful. So thanks, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.